Thank you very much, uh, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. Uh, we move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by John Swinney on the emergency budget review. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interruptions or interventions. And I call on John Swinney, uh, Deputy First Minister, for around 10 minutes, please. President Officer, Scotland is facing a cost of living crisis, a combination of the impacts of Brexit the aftermath of the pandemic and the energy crisis fuelled by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine have sent prices spiralling. Inflation is at a 40-year high and the pressure on the finances of households and businesses is acute. Public services are facing demands, entirely legitimate demands, to make significantly enhanced pay offers to their staff. As a government, we have a duty to respond, but our ability to respond is limited by the inactivity of the United Kingdom Government and the financial restrictions of devolution. The Scottish Government budget is largely fixed. We have no ability to borrow to increase our day-to-day -day spending, our reserve funding is fully utilised and our income tax powers do not allow changes to be made during the financial year. In August, we announced that we would undertake an emergency budget review to identify every possible penny to support the people of Scotland through the cost of living crisis while maintaining a pathway to balance the budget. On 7 September, I set out to Parliament the first of the hard prioritisation choices already made, and today I provide a further update on our progress through the emergency budget review process. Since September, this crisis has deepened further. The inactivity of the UK Government gave way to calamity. The United Government's mini-budget sent shockwaves through the markets, driving up borrowing costs for government, businesses and households. So disastrous was the package of unfunded and uncosted tax cuts for the rich that not only did the mini-budget not survive the month, but neither did its architects, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. The utterly needless upheaval has created significant damage for individuals and great uncertainty for Scotland's finances. Initially, the Scottish Government was told that we would receive an additional £660 million through the block grant adjustment. Now, with the new Chancellor scrapping the plan to cut the basic rate of, uh, of income tax in the rest of the United Kingdom, our funding will be reduced by £230 million over the period of the UK spending review. This represents a swing of almost £900 million in the space of less than a month. Now, under a new Prime Minister and a new Chancellor, calamity is giving way to austerity, with deep spending cuts expected. As members will be aware, I had intended to present the outcome of the emergency budget review to Parliament last week, but paused that announcement while we awaited the fiscal statement of 31 October. However, that date has now changed to 17 November. While I would have preferred to see the OBR forecast and the outcome of the UK statement prior to publishing this review, I have concluded that we can wait no longer. The scale of the challenge is so severe and the impacts and uncertainties for people, households and businesses so significant that the imperative consideration must be to provide as much stability, certainty and transparency as possible. We now also once again face the prospect of tax changes from the UK Government. It is only right then that we take the appropriate time and care to consider any impacts on our budget and devolved tax policies. So I will wait until after the UK Government's next fiscal statement before deciding on the content of any tax discussion paper. Presiding officer, I cannot overstate the degree of challenge associated with undertaking this emergency budget review. I have said, that, I've said before that in all of my experience, now and during my previous tenure as Finance Secretary, there has never been a time of greater pressure on the public finances. Inflation means that our annual budget today is worth £1.7 billion less than when it was published last December. At the same time, demand for government support and intervention is understandably increasing. I must balance the books, but I am committed to doing so in a way that prioritises funding to help families, to back business, to provide fair pay awards and to protect the delivery of public services. This emergency budget review delivers on these objectives. This Government is determined to enhance pay and target support to the lowest paid where possible, as a crucial part of our response to the cost of living crisis. This support includes offers in the region of 7% for frontline workers in the local government non-teacher and NHS agenda for change workforces. 
This would increase salaries for the lowest paid staff in Agenda for Change by over 11 per cent. Although some pay negotiations have still to conclude, I have already committed over £700 million of additional resources to fund enhanced pay settlements. I am grateful for the efforts of employers and trade unions to facilitate these vital collective bargaining processes. But to be absolutely clear, every additional penny for pay has had to be found from existing, previously allocated and agreed budgets elsewhere within the current finite Scottish budget. We have reached the limit of what can be done in terms of reprioritisation. When I set out the initial package of £560 million in savings in 2022-23, I was clear that additional savings would still be required. Today, I have published an emergency budget review that sets out a further £615 million in savings. This includes £400 million from reprioritisation of spend within health and social care to provide a fair pay offer for NHS staff and to meet the extraordinary pressures from inflation and demand as the service begins to recover from the pandemic. This has included rephasing some social care spending in line with expected spending profiles and repurposing spend in other areas such as mental health. Despite this, we continue to progress our work to deliver a national care service, as well as commitments to fair work and adult social care, and we continue to provide overall increases to mental health spending, as well as delivery of dementia, learning disability and autism services and cross-cutting trauma work. These are extraordinarily difficult choices, which no government wishes to have to make, but the full balance of health and social care reprioritisation will remain within the portfolio. A further £33 million of resource savings and £180 million of capital reductions have also been made, including reducing our marketing expenditure to below pre-COVID levels. Taken together, these decisions and those already set out in September total almost £1.2 billion. They are not decisions we would wish to make, but in the absence of additional funding from the UK Government, they are decisions that we are compelled to make. They ensure a path to a balanced budget, whilst also prioritising fair public sector pay offers and recognising that this is critical to the delivery of key public services. This Government will also always do what we can to support those most affected by the cost of living crisis. I can confirm that we have identified and allocated the resources required to double the value of the December Scot Scottish Child Bridging Payment, benefiting around 145,000 school-aged children registered to receive free school meals, to double the Fuel and Security Fund to £20 million, to increase funding to local authorities for additional discretionary housing payment support to mitigate the UK Government's benefit cap as fully as possible within our devolved powers, to introduce a new £1.4 million Island Cost Crisis Emergency Fund, to introduce new payment break options to help protect those who have taken control of debt through the highly successful debt arrangement scheme, and to implement reforms to remove cost burdens for the most financially vulnerable. In our efforts to support business, we have also looked closely at regulation and how we can make it easier for businesses to thrive, and we have used today's review to set out a range of improvements. After extensive engagement with business organisations, industry groups and individual businesses, and including industry summits on energy and financial services, we will, arrange, we will introduce a range of measures set out in the emergency budget review today. And those include building on the additional £300,000 provided to Business Energy Scotland this year by doubling the energy efficiency cashback element of the loan and cashback scheme to £20,000, protecting the Small Business Bonus Scheme, the most generous scheme in the UK, which takes over 111,000 businesses out of rates altogether, and establishing a joint task force with COSLA, local authorities and our regulatory agencies in business to consider the differing impacts of regulation on business. Providing, presiding officer, in, alongside our counterparts in Wales and Northern Ireland, we have repeatedly called on the UK Government to do more given the considerably greater flexibility available to the UK Government. The First Minister reiterated these calls to the latest Prime Minister, highlighting the essential need to provide further targeted financial support to low-income households, 
urgently provide clarity on what support will remain available for both non-domestic consumers and households following the early end to the energy price guarantee next March, and to make additional funding available so that devolved governments can support people, provide fair public sector pay uplifts and protect public services. The First Minister has also reiterated our deep concern about the risk of social security benefits not being increased with inflation in April. A permanent £25 uplift to universal credit should be introduced now, alongside the reversal of the two-child limit for universal credit and tax credits and the abolition of the benefit cap. We have been clear that an enhanced windfall tax should fund this support in place of increased borrowing or spending cuts. We are now anticipating a package of eye-watering cuts and tax rises in the autumn statement. It will be evident to all members that the emergency budget review has involved extremely difficult decisions. Even when such decisions need to be made quickly, as is the case now, I believe it is essential that we use the best available evidence and also be as transparent as possible. To that end, I would like to thank the members of our expert panel for the consideration and advice that they have provided over recent weeks and which I also published today. The panel has assessed the outlook that faces the Scottish Government in its budget and advised the Government to proceed with caution to achieve its objectives in these difficult days. In addition, I publish a new analytical report on the impact of the cost of living crisis in Scotland, alongside a high-level summary of the evidence around the equality and fairness impacts of the emergency budget review measures. The outlook for 2023-24 and beyond is clearly even more difficult than when we set out the resource spending review earlier this year, and measures for efficiency and reform in the delivery of our public services will be even more important. Nonetheless, I can assure Parliament that this Government remains firmly committed, committed and focused on continuing to support our public service recovery from the impacts of COVID, on tackling and reducing child poverty, of taking forward our net zero ambitions, and supporting strong and sustainable growth in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. The Deputy First Minister will now take questions on issues raised in his statement. I know we have slightly overrun, but I still intend to allow uh, around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will need to move to the next item of business. I would, though, encourage members to, and indeed the Cabinet Secretary to be as succinct as possible in questions and answers. And for those who have not already done so, um, could you please press your request to see speak buttons if you wish to ask a question. I now call on Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight and can I also acknowledge the difficult circumstances in which uh, the Scottish Government uh, finds itself. Uh, some of them obviously are international, some of them have been domestic and I fully acknowledge that, that part of the difficulty is the timing uh, of the forecasts and of uh, the budget. And these difficulties are substantial for the Cabinet Secretary, and I fully understand why he can't say a bit more about tax policy just now. Now, the Cabinet Secretary is always challenging the opposition parties, quite rightly so, to come up with budget suggestions of their own. So here is one, and he refers to this at the bottom of page two, and that is regarding health and social care. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does he really think that now is the appropriate time for his government to be proceeding with a National Care Service Bill, which has drawn so much criticism from virtually every stakeholder and which Audit Scotland is predicting to be costing £1.3 billion. Secondly, he has outlined further cuts to health, to education, to justice. Can I ask why there have been no further cuts to the Constitution budget? And thirdly, he's outlined uh, some measures that he's agreed with business. I think it's on page three. Uh, but can he tell us what specific measures will be put in place to boost productivity, which, as he confirmed himself at Finance Committee, is a serious issue and which undermines the tax take in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the complete sentence that Liz Smith was trying to get out at the beginning of her, um, uh, state, uh, of her contribution was to acknowledge the difficulties created for me by the decisions of the United Kingdom, as well as the timing decisions. So I think we should just um, allow, me, al allow, me, allow me to just complete that sentence for uh, Liz Smith. In relation to the National Care Service, it is a, a situation where we have a very high level of delayed discharge within our hospital system, which is creating enormous strain in uh, the delivery of national health services 
We have to recognise and acknowledge the necessity of reform, because the current arrangements are not working. We therefore have to take the steps to establish a national care service for two reasons. To ensure that members of the public are assured in all parts of the country about the quality and the range of care that will be available to them, and secondly, to ensure that we are able to support the sustainability of the National Health Service. That is why that expenditure is required. Now, on the Constitution Budget, um, I, I, I suspect what that was code for was expressing the commitment of the Government to spend £20 million on a referendum on independence. I would point out to Liz Smith that expenditure does not arise in this current financial year, and it is this current financial year that I am wrestling with uh, in its, to its greatest extent. And lastly, in relation to productivity, I have announced a set of savings that have been made here today. I am also at the same time protecting very, very significant levels of public expenditure in skills, in our universities, in our college sector, to ensure that we can invest in developing the capability of individuals in our society to maximise their economic contribution. But what would be the biggest single thing that would help productivity in this country is if we had a sensible approach to population growth and migration. And that has been abruptly halted for us by the total, the total folly of Brexit. So if I can appeal to Liz Smith and the Conservatives about anything, it, the Health Secretary points out social care. The social care sector has lost thousands of employees because of Brexit. So we need to have a sensible discussion about migration because the, uh, the behaviour of the Conservative Government, especially of the Home Secretary in recent days, is directly undermining productivity in the Scottish economy. I would, I would encourage the Cabinet Secretary to ignore sedentary interventions, either from his own bench or indeed the opposition bench. He's called Daniel Johnson. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement and where there are additional measures on the cost of living, can I welcome them? But there is no doubt the chaos emanating from the UK Government make a challenging situation that much more difficult. But in turn, I think that underlines the need for clarity and transparency from governments, be they Scottish or UK. So can I ask, proportionately, which portfolios have the largest savings to make against the budget passed earlier this year in order to achieve the £1.175 billion worth of cuts announced? As confirmed by the Fiscal Commission in paragraph 34 of their May forecast, the Scottish Government had planned to carry forward £279 million from this year's budget to next and £250 million to 2024 25 using the reserve. Is that still the case? And if not, how have those sums been allocated and what are the impacts on next year's budget in the following? And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary agrees that we must all tighten our belts. But I note that the Cabinet Secretary for External Affairs has travelled to eight countries in as many months, clocking up almost 22,000 air miles. So what cost control measures are being applied to the expenditures of members of the government and civil servants? Cabinet Secretary. Deputy First Minister. Um, the I, I think the, um, the, the steps that the government is taking about uh, clarity and transparency I think are evident by the fact that I am here today and that I appeared before the Finance Committee several weeks ago on the subject at a session chaired by um, Mr Johnson. And I also appeared at, uh, in Parliament in early September to explain openly the changes and the choices that I was making. So I think on the question of transparency, this government is delivering on what would be expected uh, of the, uh, b by the public. What I have tried to do, I have not uh, approached this from the perspective of applying a, 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 a random uh, uh, reduction across portfolios. What I have had to do is to look at this very advanced stage in the financial year, at what options remain available to me to reprioritise spending. And in some areas of government activity, there is more scope to do that than in others. In the case of the changes in relation to health and social care, I was absolutely clear with the 
um, with the Health Secretary and the Health Portfolio that whatever savings we were able to identify would be retained within the Health and Social Care Portfolio to support the very strong pay offer that has been made, particularly for uh, low-income uh, uh, staff. In relation to the reserve, we have, we have carried forward the, um, the, the resources from the last financial year into this year that we planned. We, obviously, the budget for next year was predicated in the resource spending review on a carryover from this year to next year. I have yet to identify those resources. That remains a, 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 an ongoing challenge before the end of the financial year, and I am still working to ensure I can balance the budget this year, which is my statutory duty to do so. And lastly, on the question of the international engagement of the government, we are a government that we can't be insular. We have got to be in contact with the rest of the world. I am quite sure it is really, really important that we maintain that dialogue. The Prime Minister was, the Prime Minister was being criticised just yesterday for not going to COP27. I am delighted he is now going. So I think international dialogue is essential for every single government, including the Scottish Government. Could I encourage members not just to listen to the questions but also to listen to the answers? Can I now uh, call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Kenneth Gibson? Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Make no mistake, we're here in large part because of the calamitous decisions by the Conservative Government. They've added hundreds of pounds to people's mortgages, and it is unforgivable. That's why we need a general election. But the choices this Government have made are manifestly wrong as well. Irrespective of when that £20 million is allocated for, we're still spending civil service time and money on the production of constitutional papers, £17 million on national testing every year, and up to a £1 billion on the ministerial takeover of social care. All the while, councils are being squeezed to the pits, long COVID sufferers are a bit, continue to struggle without, and £38 million is being stripped from mental health. On this last point, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, what has changed in the severity of the national mental health crisis that he can find that level of money to cut from the mental health budget? Deputy First Minister. So, so let me address two particular points that Mr Cole Hamilton raises. First of all, in relation to local authorities. Local authorities will be getting significantly more resources as a consequence of the reprioritisation exercises I have gone through to support very strong pay deals that are assisting uh, local government employees on low incomes. And I'm sure that's something that Mr Cole Hamilton would welcome. In relation to the question on mental health, I acknowledge the significance of the, the questions around mental health. Indeed, in my dialogue with the Health Secretary, we have both been determined to ensure that we protect the mental health services as much as we possibly can do. So what has been announced today will uh, will mean that the resources allocated to mental health are not increasing as fast as we had planned. They will still be growing, yeah. but they will not be growing as fast as we had hoped. Now, I am not going to suggest or to minimise the significance of that decision, but it comes about because I have limited options at this stage in the financial year, and it is an indication of anything else to any Member of Parliament of the severity of the situation that we face in public expenditure terms that I am having to take decisions of that type. As I said in my statement, I would prefer not to be taking those decisions, but I have to do that to fulfil my duty to, to, to balance our, uh, uh, our resources in a financial year and also to make sure I can support uh, employees, particularly in low incomes, in dealing with the cost of living crisis that they all face. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Douglas Lomster. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that the emergency budget review is stark about the difficulties caused by inflation eroding the Scottish budget, the limited fiscal powers of this Parliament and the refusal of the UK Tory Government to either increase the resources available to Scottish Ministers or devolve those powers necessary to deliver for the people and communities of Scotland in these challenging times? And can he advise of his engagement with business and trade unions throughout the emergency budget review process? Deputy First Minister. On, on the question of um, dialogue with uh, business and trade, union, we, trade unions, we have obviously taken forward a number of discussions uh, with business and trade unions. I have held business roundtables myself. Uh, I met with a whole range of trade unions to hear their views and their perspective on these questions, and it has informed the conclusions that we have come to. Mr Gibson raises um, a, a key observation 
about the uh, limited scope that I have to take different, a different course of action because the budget for each financial year is largely fixed unless the United Kingdom Government changes its position. Uh, and obviously, um, I have made the case to the United Kingdom Government to recognise the unprecedented effect of inflation in this financial year. There has been no financial year under devolution in which we have come anywhere close to the inflationary pressures that we are facing. And that merits an intervention which I have asked the United Kingdom Government to undertake. Okay, we have got eight further speakers in seven and a half minutes in this session, so I am going to have to speed up both the, the questions and indeed the answers, De uh, Deputy First Minister. Douglas Livingston. Um, President Officer, the Scottish Government has received specific Barnet consequentials this financial year for things like the UK Government's Housing Support Fund. However, the Scottish Government has not always been transparent on how this money has been spent. Could the Deputy First Minister commit to publishing information on how the Scottish Government has spent all consequential funding it has received throughout this financial year? Deputy First Minister. Well, what, how, how consequential funding works is that the UK Government takes its decisions, the money is transferred to the Scottish Government, and they, we publish in extraordinary detail our budget plans, the autumn budget revision and the spring budget revision to give a complete picture during the financial year. Uh, Mr Arthur will be going to committee shortly once the autumn budget review is uh, published to explain its contents. But I have also come to Parliament with two additional substantive financial statements in early September and today, transparently setting out what the Government is doing with all the resources available to us. John Mason to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Hey, thank you. C can the Deputy First Minister confirm that this statement is based on the assumption that Westminster will not either increase or decrease our block grant in the current year, 2022-23, and if they were to do that on the 17th of November, what would happen? Deputy First Minister, the, the, this statement is predicated on the fact that we, we receive neither a, an increase nor a decrease in the funds we expect to receive from the United Kingdom government. That risk is not just apparent um, on the 17th of November. That risk also extends until the moment at which the United Kingdom Government undertakes its supplementary estimates, the date for which I am not yet certain. Um, so there is risk involved in all of this. Um, we, there, there could be an upside, but equally there could be a downside. But uh, I have to take decisions to properly set out the budget choices the Scottish Government is making. And, if I, uh, uh, and at times I have to do that without the complete picture of information that ordinarily would be available to me. Paul well, Sweeney to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I note the Deputy First Minister's comments regarding the potential impact of the eminent UK fiscal statement on our devolved tax policies and his intention to wait until we hear that statement itself to consider further discussion on tax. But if I could push him ever so slightly on this, there are a number of underutilised devolved tax options which we should be fully considering that could generate revenue to invest in the areas outlined today which are stretched so thin. So will the Deputy First Minister commit in principle to a comprehensive review of devolved tax policies within the gift of the Scottish Parliament following the UK Government's fiscal statement? Deputy First Minister. Well, I, I, I have to do that because I have to set tax rates on an annual basis, so that will be undertaken. If there are particular propositions that Mr Sweeney would like me to consider, I would be very happy to, to receive them in writing, or I could meet with him and hear the points that he would like to put to me. Michelle Thompson to be followed by Ross Greer. The Cabinet Secretary is faced with two aspects of risk of particular concern. Firstly, the uncertainty created by chaotic UK government economic policies, and secondly, the undoubted harm about to be inflicted on the average citizen come the Chancellor's autumn statement. That the Chancellor has taken advice from George Osborne, the architect of austerity, is no comfort on either front. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore indicate the basis of discussions with the latest UK Chancellor, or indeed if he has been consulted with him by him at all? Deputy First Minister. I have had an initial discussion with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on uh, the approach to the November 17th statement. Uh, that has not in any shape or form covered substantive details. I have been promised substantive engagement before the UK statement, and obviously I will make myself available for any of that dialogue um, at any opportunity. Ross Greer to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Further to that answer, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary what response he has received from the UK Government to the Scottish Government's specific requests that the financial statement for this current year be inflation-proofed? Deputy First Minister. Yeah. 
I have not had a positive response to that yet, despite the fact we have asked for that um, on a number of occasions. Kate Forbes uh, asked for that issue to be addressed in the summer uh, before she um, went on maternity leave. Uh, I reiterated that. The First Minister has made that point, and I will continue to stress that point because this, uh, as I said in one of my earlier answers, this is a year quite without precedent of the scale of inflationary pressures. And Ordinarily, if inflation is 2 or 3 per cent, it's not really going to cause much of a financial strain. Inflation at 10 per cent is a real financial strain. And, you know, the, the Criminal Justice Committee this morning heard evidence from the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service about the issues that a public service like the prison service is wrestling with. So the point that Mr Greer makes to me, and which I will be taking to the UK Government, is an entirely valid point of view. Stuart McMillan, to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With the key levers to address the cost of crisis, cost of crisis, sorry, in the hands of the UK Government, the Scottish Government is severely constrained in terms of the funding which is available to it to take action to support people in Scotland, including my great number of Clyde constituency. This clearly shows the deficiencies of the current fiscal framework. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that the full suite of powers available to an independent Scotland, that this Parliament would have been able to more fully uh, deal with and mitigate the cost crisis? Deputy First Minister. There, there are very clearly uh, constraints on what we are able to do because our budget largely is fixed because of the nature of the arrangements that we, we face. So Mr McMillan makes the, the fair and reasonable point that there are a range of other powers and responsibilities that could be used to provide us with much greater flexibility in addressing the challenges that we face. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister has announced spending reprioritisation worth four hundred million across health and social care portfolios. This includes cuts to mental health and primary care spending. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister whether the Scottish Government has carried out an analysis on the impact of these cuts to those receiving mental health treatment or primary care funding and where exactly this money is to be taken away from? Deputy First Minister. Mr. Officer, as I explained in my answer to Alec Cole Hamilton, the, uh, the issues in, well, well, they'll vary in, in different uh, budget lines in relation to mental health. The budget will not be increasing as fast as we had hoped and wanted to ensure in relation to some of the work around about primary care. We will be asking uh, for uh, reserve funding that is held by health and social care partners to be used as an early priority rather than it being uh, retained while further strain is carried by public funds. Um, I would point out to Mr Stewart that we are having to do this because of the severe financial pressure applied to us by the mismanagement by the United Kingdom Government of the public finances and the economy, where inflation has been allowed to, to rage rampant across our society. So those are the hard choices that we have got to address uh, as we deliver on the expectations of members of the public. And in relation to the impact on members of the public, we have published an equality assessment which addresses many of the issues that Mr Stewart raises with me. And as briefly as possible, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. The rising cost of living is having a substantial impact on families across Scotland, and so far the UK Government has failed to provide any certainty to families on low incomes. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that the UK Government should, be, should give a clear commitment in its upcoming fiscal statement that Social Security benefits will be increased in line with inflation? As briefly as possible, Deputy First Minister. Yeah, I think that would help uh, members of the public facing the acute challenges. Obviously, we have taken decisions to boost the support available to families facing financial hardship, and I would encourage the UK Government to do likewise. 